Well, with more now on her conversation with President Carter of CBS This Morning co-host Nora O'Donnell. Thank you very much for yeah. coming by. Um, I said to you earlier, when I listen to him talk, it's just so soothing. He's so calm. Um, in speaking about North Korea, he has been there three times. He has spoken to leaders there. How does he feel about the possibility of a new dialogue now? And would he be willing to maybe weigh in a little bit? Well, he's still getting briefings from the White House's former presidents can ask for intelligence briefings. And so he's particularly interested in the Korean Peninsula. Actually, when he first served in the Navy, he was in a submarine in that area and so has been interested in the Korean Peninsula his entire life. And he's visited three times, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think he would go over as some sort of preliminary trip as an emissary to sort of begin talks. That's the role. He says he's spoken with President Trump twice and made the offer that he would be willing to do that. But President Carter, is 93 years old. He is trying to limit his travel, but uh, he's engaged in the region. And I think we're going to, if, if all comes, President Trump has said he would meet with Kim Jong un by uh, the end of May. So this timeline is compressed. You know, I'm struck by just watching him and knowing what he's gone through. He looks great. He looks lucid. He sounds great. Um, he still teaches Sunday school. How much? Does, I mean, we all know, we've, I, going back to when we were children, his faith played a major role in his life. It always has, going back to his days in World War II. Um, what did you learn from listening to him talk about that? Well, it's an incredible book because, as you mentioned, I, I didn't know that he had, he had taught Sunday school. But not only has he studied the Christian faith, he has studied world religions. And he reads a lot of philosophy. And I'm a philosopher, was a philosophy major in college. And so the nice thing about this book, while he talks a lot about kind of what's happening domestically and a little bit about the current administration, it's largely the discussion in his book about not only concerns about faith in God, whatever God you may worship, but also faith in ourselves faith in institutions, faith in other people. So it's sort of an expansive argument about that. And I also think he's raising questions about the growing income inequality in America, um, the lack of charity um, that we engage in towards one another and to other people in our community. So it was, it was nice to be able to sit down with him and sort of talk about those larger issues when mm. lately I think we've all been fo focused on crisis and chaos. Division, yeah, yeah, for sure. He's pondered all of these things, I'm sure, for a very long time. Why did he say that this was the toughest book for him to write? Maybe perhaps because of his age and also um, his 32nd book and also because I think he's trying to leave a legacy. I think he is acutely aware of his own mortality. Um, he's been in cancer remission now for just about over two years. He was diagnosed with melanoma and it had spread. He had spots on his lung. And, excuse me, spots on his liver and on his brain. And then he took this immunotherapy drug called Keyuta, which was experimental, and it worked on him. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it wow. really only works in about one in three patients. And it worked on him, and his scan is clean. Wow. Yeah. That's so, remarkable. So I think he has faced his own immortality, prepared to die, told his family, and then has been given this extra time. And I think that's part of the reason it's influenced. This book was, as, as he said, the hardest it's written, he's written. Uh, let me ask you, um, you, you spoke to him about the NRA. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's listen to a little bit of what he had to say. The NRA basically represents the gun manufacturers and sellers instead of the average hunters and, and, and people that use guns for, for their own defense. So, so I think the distortion of, uh, of the Second Amendment has been a mistake. There's no threat to the Second Amendment among the desire of the young people to have good background checks before you can buy a weapon and to do away with the rapid fire military weapons that we have authorized. It's interesting to hear him say that because some of the Parkland students have said the very much the same thing. What did he have to say about the March for Our Lives movement? Well, he said he was inspired by uh, these young students and he thought that it could lead to change. And there's actually a section in his book um, about gun rights because he grew up in Georgia, always had a, you know, on a farm, always had, always had a gun, still to this day has guns and speaks about the proliferation of guns uh, in America. Uh, specifically that, you know, 33,000 people are killed every year by gun deaths. The majority of those are actually by suicide, mm. mm. self-inflicted um, gunshot wounds. And then he goes through, you know, how our gun rate death is exponentially higher than in England, than in Japan. And so we're the only industrialized country in the world that's killing ourselves and one another at the rate. And so he's been an advocate of um, keeping the Second Amendment, but further restraint on the NRA. But I think it's interesting that a lot of this book too, I think he's worried about faith. He's worried about faith in our institutions, the lack of faith in our institutions that we've seen. And yet the young people 
are and what the Parkland students have done is sort of a counter argument to that, that cynicism that may exist. They still believe they can make a change. Mm -hmm. I feel that's so interesting that here's a man with, particularly through all his charitable work, has inspired so many people and right. he has found inspiration in these children. Um, does, he's does, at peace. He's at you know, peace. I think that when you said that, when you said that it made you feel so calm, he's, he's at peace with who he is. And I think even though while he leveled some pretty tough criticism about President Trump and the decisions he's made and is really worried about nuclear war. I mean, the choice of John Bolton and what may happen um, in North Korea. He is at somewhat at peace. I, I wonder, and, and this is the question that I, I have for you, having, when you sit in front of a former president of the United States, somebody who's as old as he is, I, and I don't mean, I mean mm -hmm. that he's lived through so yeah, much, yeah. he has seen so much, and he is a peacemaker. He brought Israel and Egypt together. That was seen as impossible back when he did that. What does it feel for you to sit in, in the presence of someone well, like that? Well, also to be reminded, someone who grew up in a home where there was no running water or electricity, you right, know, no right. inside toilets the inside The greatest their generation home. is what yes, he is. Yes, who in Georgia, of course, um, originally was close, which was unusual, too, with African Americans, right. you know. Um, so it was, a, as a historical figure, you know, talking to him about that. But I do think, you know, from a national security, he is really big on the issue of, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. He makes a point that saying, through my four years in office, there were no um, guns fired, no military conflict. And so I think that's at the top of his mind, looking at where we currently are, given that we're still at war mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, that we had the long conflict, certainly in Iraq, that that's at the top of his mind. And he's written about North Korea a great deal, not just in this interview, because as we talked about earlier, he's been there three times, but points out North Korea is the biggest national security threat in the world right now. Fascinating. Yeah, Nora, Does he have another book in him? I th no, he did. He <laughs> said this was the last one. And in fact, he said his wife, Rosalind Carter, just went through a major surgery. Mm. She's also 90 years old. And um, so they're actually, he just said, they're, they're informing the Carter Center that they no longer will be involved in the, you know, in, in any of the decision making. Mm, wow. Well, it's a, it's a great interview. Um, and the book is called Faith, Faith, Jimmy Carter, Journey for All. Yeah. Nora, thank you very much. Sure, thank you. And be sure to stay tuned to our next hour when we will play Nora's full conversation with former President Jimmy Carter.